All right, well, we're going to continue our series, Always Be Ready, and it is a series on apologetics. We're looking at the big questions of life, the big questions about God, and we're diving into doctrine, that dreaded word that everybody hates, right? Doctrine. Our key text is 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to some people, to a few people, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And so important at the end there with meekness and fear. And we always say we're not here to argue. We're not here to win arguments. We're here to win people to the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, we've kind of entered a subcategory of this apologetics um, series where we're defending the three angels and every word of the three angels messages as you study it out is so critical and important, isn't it? We see this in Selected Messages, Volume 3 here. She says, Satan is constantly seeking to cast his hellish shadow about these messages so that the remnant people of God shall not clearly discern their import, their time, and their place. Do you feel that you're distracted today? The world's coming at you from every direction, isn't it? We lose sight of the hour in which we live. Now, as we've studied these messages together, we're using the sanctuary as our template, aren't we? Something that most of Christianity has lost sight of. And the Bible tells us that God's way is in the sanctuary, the way of salvation. Every truth that we hold dear is actually found in the sanctuary message. Isn't that true? And so it will continue to be our guidepost today as we continue to look here at the first angel's message. Now, in quick review, we've already looked at the everlasting gospel. Again, using the sanctuary, the everlasting gospel was complete redemption. This was a complete rescue plan. It wasn't justification only. It wasn't, you know, falling short in any area. We went from justification to sanctification to glorification. God uh, basically releasing us from the penalty of sin and justification, from the power of sin in sanctification, and from the presence of sin in glorification. And that, brothers and sisters, is the true gospel. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm just checking. All right. So we continued saying with a loud voice here in the first angel's message, fear God and give glory. And we've really been in these four words for several weeks now because they're so profound. There is so much to those four words. And so, so far we've looked at what does it mean to give glory to God? And on the outset, it pulled us right into the most holy place, didn't it? I mean, when the announcement comes, the hour of his judgment has come. Where does that put us in the sanctuary? It's, it's in the most holy. So this first angel's message is really bringing us into the holy of holies, a very solemn place to be. And we found as we looked at that everlasting gospel that its ultimate fulfillment, its ultimate conclusion is that it would bring Christ's character into yours if you would let it. That was number one. Last time, we looked at the fact that there is no dichotomy between body and spirit, as is popularly taught, that how you treat the body actually affects your spirituality. Isn't that true? And so last time, we looked at how we give glory to God by the health choices we make. How do we treat the body? Are we glorifying God in those choices? Are we being selfish and abusing the body, the very thing that God gave us on this earth? The third thing, and I hesitate to even mention it out loud. And will you still love me if I tell you the truth? Do you promise? All right. The third thing is also related to the body. And it's glorifying God in our appearance. Now, this is something that's rarely taught anymore within Adventism. But brothers and sisters, is it important? I wonder. Is it worth our time to study together what the Bible says about what we put on? how we carry ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, just, just to bring the point back to the fact that your body, what you are, is actually compared to the sanctuary, to the temple. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The temple, the sanctuary, is likened unto your body. 
And that's so critical because when you look at that Hebrew sanctuary, the model that was given there, that Moses was told to make a pattern, you know, after the pattern that he saw, I should say. On the outside, as you look at the sanctuary, isn't it modestly dressed, fully covered, simple, modest, right? Where's all the glitz and glam in the sanctuary, by the way? Huh, it's on the inside. Matter of fact, to see the glitz and glam, you had to be a priest or to go into the holies of holies, you had to be the high priest. That's where the most attractive things were. They were on the inside of the sanctuary. It's no different for us today. So the, so the accusations of the world, the, the questions that we're going to answer today are God doesn't care about what you wear. That's what we hear, right? That's legalism. You're, you're taking things too far. I mean, you start talking about modesty and wearing of, of jewelry and trinkets. I mean, come on, God doesn't care about that stuff. That's the accusation. But what is the reality? We read here in Spirit of Prophecy, fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. Isn't that something? I have been shown that our church rules are very deficient. There is a terrible sin upon us as a people that we have permitted our church members to dress in a manner inconsistent with their faith. We must arise at once and close the door against the allurements of fashion. Unless we do this, our churches will become demoralized. Wow, do you think it's important? Do you think it's relevant today? Let's begin our study back at the beginning of the rebellion. Satan in the courts of heaven. We find here in Ezekiel chapter 28, you know, as many pictures and, and graphics that I try to find, you know, you find lots of stuff about the rebellion, Satan in heaven, the rebellion that took place. He's got the scowl, he's got the sword, he's got all these things, but I have never once found a picture of Satan that looks like this. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your what? Covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Can you imagine a coat like that? A covering that had all of those gems and sparkly things upon it. And unfortunately, we know the story. What God had meant for glory, Satan began to distort into pride and arrogance. We read as we continue in Ezekiel 28 and verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of what? Because of your beauty. We read in the great controversy, page 495, pride in his own glory nourished the desire for supremacy. The high honors conferred upon Lucifer were not appreciated as the gift of God and called forth no gratitude to the creator. He glorified in his brightness and exaltation and aspired to be equal with God. Wow. We know that that fall did not stay in the heavenly courts, did it? When Lucifer rebelled and was cast out, where did he come? Here, that's right. And we know that that rebellion continued through the fall of Adam and Eve. They then began not to reflect the character of God, but to reflect the character of this arch enemy. And so the desire to glorify self has now become part of the nature of humanity. It's something that every single one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, you might say, I, I have no problem with vanity. Brothers and sisters, it's in your very nature you struggle. Anytime you see a picture, this is a psychological fact. Group picture, you take a family picture. Someone comes around, shows you the picture. You see no one else. Who do you see? You immediately dive to what did I look like? It doesn't matter what everybody else looked like. I mean, they could have had their eyes closed out of the picture. It just doesn't matter. The very focus of your eyes goes immediately to me. Brothers and sisters, it's ingrained in us all. Now, what's interesting is we follow this train of thought. 
Genesis 2 describes the world before sin, you know, before the fall wrecked everything. It says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four riverheads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilia, where there is what? Gold. And the gold of that land is good. Brothers and sisters, I want you to picture in your mind's eye the, the earth. And again, I have never found an illustration that I could share that, you know, it's always gardens and flowers and beautiful things, but get this in your mind's eye before sin, gold was on the face of the earth, diamonds, all kinds of precious stone. They glittered the surface of the earth. It was all there, all for God's glory. It was all right there on the surface of the earth. And I've tried, I've looked for way too long to find a picture that would represent that. It just isn't there. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, God bestowed upon these antediluvians, which would be the people before the flood, many and rich gifts, but they used his bounties to glorify who? Themselves. You see the problem? The problem nature that had been passed from Satan to them is now living itself out. They glorify themselves and turn them into a curse by fixing their affections upon the gifts instead of the giver. They employed the gold and silver and precious stones and the choice wood in the construction of habitations for themselves and endeavored to excel one another in beautifying their dwellings with the most skillful workmanship. They sought only to gratify the desires of their own proud hearts and revealed in, reveled in scenes of pleasure and wickedness self-glorification. This is pride. It's lived out. It's, it's coming naturally. It's the, it's the nature of the arch enemy being lived out in humanity. You know, I think it's interesting. You, you search the Bible for things that God hates. Have you ever done this? There's a profound verse in Proverbs 6. It says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, by the way, there are seven, right? Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And the very first one, what's the first one that's mentioned? Pride. A proud look. Wow. In a selfie world that we live in, right? Everyone getting the best angle. The pouty lips, right? A proud look. That's the very first thing mentioned that God hates. Let's continue as we, we follow this study. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great. We're traveling now forward in time, approaching the flood. It says that, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the very intent of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil continually. And so we know the story. God found in Noah and his family, brought them in, in the ark there, and they were preserved, but the rest of the world was destroyed in the flood. It was, it was the great reset, right? The first one. Okay. But notice what she says, Patriarchs and Prophets 108, by the same means, the silver and gold, the choice wood and precious stones, you know, that littered the face of the earth, which had enriched and adorned the world before the flood, and which the inhabitants had idolized, were concealed from the sight and search of men. The violent action of the waters, piling earth and rocks upon these treasures, and in some cases even forming mountains above them, God saw that the more he enriched and prospered sinful men, the more they would corrupt their ways before him. The treasures that should have led them to glorify the bountiful giver had been worshipped, while God had been dishonored and despised. You know what's happening here? God's taking what was on the outside and he's putting it back on the inside. He says, well, fallen man, this isn't safe. It's not safe. We're not in a position to decorate ourselves with these things, to, to put them in our houses and to, to use them as sort of social status. We're not safe in this fallen condition. God says, in order to somewhat quell evil, I'm just going to bury it. I'm going to make it hard to find. And from the fall forward, you're going to find a continual thread in Scripture that adornment and the wearing of jewelry is likened to or leads to adultery. You just can't get around it. You find as you move through Genesis, Jacob, as he is trying to have some reformation and revival among his family, he recognizes that they have drifted away. He instructs his family the following, Genesis chapter 35, verses 2 through 4. 
And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your what? Garments. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. We read here, Spirit of Prophecy, she says, Jacob was humbled and required his family to humble themselves and to lay off all their ornaments, for he was to make an atonement for their sins by offering a sacrifice unto God that he might be entreated for them and not leave them to be destroyed by other nations. God accepted the efforts of Jacob to remove the wrong from his family and appeared unto him and blessed him and renewed the promise made to him because his fear was before him. We move on now. We're just traveling through the Bible. The experience of the Israelites as they're led out of Egypt, right prior to that, God actually instructs them to ask from the Egyptians of their gold and their silver. You see, back then, gold and silver and, and these items, this was a form of currency. It wasn't God's will that they wear them, but basically God was saying, you plunder the Egyptians for all the slavery that you've had to endure. So we find in Exodus 12, 35 and 36, now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested, thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now again, this was payment. This was like saying, you know, we've worked for you all this time and never got paid. And so here it is. Was this troublesome to the Israelites moving forward? Yeah, it didn't take long, right? The fallen nature that wants to glorify self just doesn't seem to do well with these articles. As Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, what's happening down below? Yeah, party's probably an understatement, right? Again, I look for adequate pictures, but there wouldn't be any that would be appropriate to put up here because it wasn't just a party. This was an abomination of an abominations going on down below. Now the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain and the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Notice the sons are wearing earrings too. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And haven't you ever pondered this text here? And they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Wow. Now, this was not an innocent festivity as they're worshiping this golden calf. We'll find out later they had stripped off their garments. If you can picture that scene, this is riotous behavior. This is base passion with all kinds of riotous music, so much the so that when Moses comes down the mountain, Joshua says there is war in the camp. And of course, when Moses comes upon the scene, he is angered at the sight. And we know the story well. Exodus 32, 19 through 20. So it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf. Now listen to this. He took the calf, which they had made. He burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel do what? Drink it. Do you see what's happening here? God is taking what's on the outside and he's putting it where? On the inside. Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, what that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now listen, listen to what happened to Aaron. This always kind of makes me chuckle a little bit. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me and I cast it into the fire and this calf came out. Probably not. 
Probably not, right? Since we just read in the previous text that he engraved it, like he molded it and fashioned it with his own hands. Now here it is. Here's the other part of our modesty message today. And when Moses saw that the people were what? Naked. For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. You know, nakedness. Along with the jewelry is another permeating thing in our society, isn't it? And even among God's people, if I can be as bold as to say that today, it's like we're pushing the envelope, right? It's like, where do you want to draw the line? What does, what does nakedness represent? Is it salvation or is it condemnation? When Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They lost their covering, that robe of light, and now they are naked before them. It should have brought great shame. And as we are developing as a society, it's like we have no shame anymore. You know, I think it's interesting that one of the horrible things that they did to Jesus on the cross was they stripped him of his garments. Because it was the most shameful thing that could come upon a person hanging there as a condemned criminal, completely naked for you and I. And yet here we are as God's people, some of us are seeking to be naked. What's wrong with us, brothers and sisters? This is a picture of what the beaches used to look back, like back in the late 1800s. And I can freely show that to you in church and have no shame. Isn't that interesting? Here's some other beachgoers. Doesn't look like their fun has been quelled at all, does it? This is an illustration of the progression just up to 1927. And I wouldn't dare go past 1927, right? Are we desensitized to what's happening in our world today? Yes, for sure. And if physical nakedness also parallels spiritual nakedness, then I think we need to be concerned and, and actually be aware of what Satan is doing to us. Revelation 16, 15, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk what? Naked, and they see his shame. We should not feel the desire to let our mess hang out. Can I just say it like that? What are we advertising? What do we want people to see? Brothers and sisters, we should feel shame and we should keep ourselves covered to God's glory. Wouldn't you agree with that today? Exodus 33, as we continue our story, for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, this is after the golden calf incident. He says, now, therefore, notice what they have on again. Now, therefore, take off your what? Ornaments that I may know what to do with you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount, Mount Horeb. Let's go further in the story now. As we read most of the Old Testament prophecies, you know, in, the, in prophecy, God's people are likened unto a woman. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. And you see God often likening Israel to a woman who's committing adultery, and he has to woo her back to him, and he's warning her. But in these illustrations are these powerful truths that when Israel in is, a, is in apostasy, when she's in an abominating practice, often she's likened to a woman that's dressed a certain way. We find in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 13, God says, I will punish her being Israel for the days of the Baals to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she what? She forgot, says the Lord. Isaiah 3, verses 16 through 18. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are what? Haughty. What's that mean? Proud. Yeah, because they're proud and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, look, walk, uh, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingling with their feet. What's that mean? What's all over their feet and their ankles? 
all kinds of bracelets and bells and clanking things. You know, that's what we do when we, when we dress this way, right? We're basically saying, look at me. Look at me, everyone. I often thought it was funny. You know, people say, don't stare. You got in public. Oh, this person's, you know, covered in all kinds of craziness. And you say, the people they're with say, don't stare, don't stare. That's what they want, right? That's why they did that. So that everybody looks. Anyway, it says, therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab, the crown of the head, the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery, the jingling anklets, the scarves and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the veils, the headdresses, the leg ornaments and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms and the rings, the nose jewels, the festal apparel and the mantles, the outer garments, the purses and the mirrors. Your men shall fall by. Now, let me back up here. What happens to, to most of in our society today, although things are changing, is that this is a vicious cycle that Satan has. He gets the women in the area of vanity because that's where he gets the men who look at the women who are struggling with vanity. You hear what I'm saying? And it's like this perfect thing that he has going on. It's like this cycle of sin. The women try to look prettier and the men keep looking and it's just like where one goes, the other goes. And I always thought it was interesting after all that God says he's going to take away because they have fallen, they're, they're doing these abominable things. Then the next thing that happens is that the men fall. Isaiah 325, your men shall fall by the sword, your mighty in the war. This is a cyclical problem. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, as we trans transition into the New Testament here, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and notice these things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is that not what we're talking about this morning? Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it be, but he who does the will of God abides forever. It's like vanity, uh, vanity breeds vanity, right? Vanity breeds vanity. Lust breeds lust. It's this terrible cycle that Satan has going. What does the New Testament say? Is this just an Old Testament thing? We get to the New Testament. Jesus died on the cross. Now we wear what we want. We throw off our garments. We are free. No. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10, in like manner, that the women adorn themselves in what kind of apparel? Modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. And again, God wants the glittery things. He wants the attractive things to be on the inside not on the outside. First Peter 3, 3 through 4, who's adorning, he's talking to the women now, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man where? Of the heart. And that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great price. We've come so far in our society in this rebellion that I really shouldn't even be talking just to women anymore. This is, this is universal, right? Men are putting on jewelry. I mean, sometimes I'm in places, I don't know if it's a man or a woman. I have no idea. And these sites, you know, this stuff used to be a, a carnival sideshow. Now it's your waitress. Now it's your hairdresser. And you can see how much joy it's bringing to the individual, right? how happy they look, how satisfied, how convenient that must be getting ready in the morning, right? Testimonies, volume four, Satan is constantly devising some new style of dress that shall prove an injury to physical and moral health. And he exults when he sees professed Christians eagerly accepting the fashions that he has invented. You think there's Anything new about people cutting themselves or popping holes in their body? I'll tell you, if you had a time machine and could go back to Bible times in the heathen nations, this was just as popular then as it is today. 
The amount of physical suffering created by unnatural and unhealthful dress cannot be estimated. Well, you might be sitting there saying, yeah, I don't get a problem with this, right? I don't have these problems. Well, I'm not done yet. What about the wedding ring? What are we going to do with the wedding ring? It's in the Bible, right? The wedding ring. Second Opinions chapter 2, verse 34. No? It's not there. The wedding ring is completely pagan. It has no origins in the Bible at all. We read from Spirit of Prophecy, some have a burden in regard to the wearing of a marriage ring, feeling that the wives of our ministers should conform to this custom. All this is what? Unnecessary. Let the minister's wives have the golden link which binds their souls to Jesus Christ, a pure and holy character. The true love and meekness and godliness that are the fruit born upon the Christian tree and their influence will be secure anywhere. We need not wear the sign, for we are not untrue to our marriage vow. And the wearing of the ring would be no evidence that we were true. I feel deeply over this leavening process, which seems to be going on among us in the conformity to the custom and fashion. Not one penny should be spent for a circlet of gold to testify that we are married. Wow. Simple. It's just a ring. I didn't spend a lot on it. It's, it doesn't attract any attention. Testimonies volume four, that ring encircling your finger may be very plain, but it is what? It's useless, and the wearing of it has a wrong influence upon others. Let's carry on, shall we? Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Do we have a problem with that in society, do you think? Yeah. Sometimes it's frustrating you shopping and it's like, am I in the women's section or the men's section? I'm halfway through and I'm like, I'm on the wrong side. Have you ever done that? Come on. It's huge. I didn't even put Romans chapter one in here where we're living in a world right now that has abandoned God as the creator. And the, the natural result is that we're losing our identity and it's happening so quickly. And it's going after our young people more than any other right now. And it's so sad. It's heartbreaking. Of all the things to worry about growing up, the one thing I wouldn't want somebody of that age to worry about is what gender am I? Let's carry on, shall we? Leviticus 19, verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. Now, again, as I'm saying all this up here, please, I hope everybody here recognizes I am not in any way condemning anybody here. Amen? I love you. I, and as I ask you in the beginning, you're still going to love me if I tell the truth, right? And I recognize that you may have come from the battlefield, right? We all have holes and scars and marks that are from the previous life. What I'm talking about is going forward, amen? As we've surrendered our life to the Lord, that kind of practice should stop. We should just leave it in the dirt, recognize it as the love of the world and let it behind us to his glory. But there are things sometimes you just can't change. You're, you've got tattoos, you've got holes in your ears or your nose or wherever else. It just doesn't matter. God meets us just where we are. Amen. What I'm talking about here is going forward. And from this point forward, as you surrender to Jesus, let's not graffiti the holy place. Amen. Your body is the temple of God. And no way we would take spray paint into that temple or any other marking tool. No. And it says here, cuttings or marks for the flesh or for the dead. Have you ever noticed how much of the tattoo world is really sort of like glamorizing death? Skeletons and all kinds of things. And I've talked to so many people in the last couple of years as I've thought about this verse who say, oh, my grandpa passed away or this person, and I want to get this big tattoo on my back to in honor of him. That's exactly what this text is talking about. It's a pagan practice. It's, it's right out of Satan's playbook, right? You know, in Revelation, 
we already talked about in, in Bible prophecy, uh, a woman represents God's people, right? In Revelation, there's actually two women. There's the pure woman, who's God's remnant church, and then there is Babylon, the abominable woman here. Now notice, even in the imagery and prophecy, the difference in dress. Talking about this, this abominable woman. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with what? Gold. And what? Precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written. That's like a tattoo, right? It's tattooed right on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. This is a very reflection of Satan's plan right here. The harlot, Babylon the Great. I mean, in the distance, don't you hear the echo? You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You see, when we adorn ourselves, when we start putting this junk on, we are merely reflecting the character of the arch enemy. Let me just say something for the mothers out there. Because this starts young. This starts so early, and it can be a playful thing. It can be a dress-up time. But the seeds of pride, brothers and sisters, cannot be unplanted. Not by our hands. Amen? Testimonies, Volume 5. When they see their children inclined to follow worldly fashions, they should, like Abraham, resolutely command their households after them. Don't let it into your house brothers and sisters, it will plant seeds that will bring you devastating consequences. Mothers set the example of pride for their children, and by so doing, sow seed that will spring up and bear fruit. When you would counteract the sad lesson you have taught your children, you will find it a hard thing. As we consider this this morning, you know, it's easy to sit in the pew and say, well, I'm glad he's talking about this because so-and-so needs to hear it. It's easy to deflect upon others, but this, this is a, a wide-branching message, isn't it? I mean, let's not leave it at jewelry. And this can be houses. This can be vehicles we drive. This can be the jobs that we have. This pride, this adornment can come in so many different flavors. Are you willing to lay it at Jesus' feet this morning? You know, I remember so vividly years and years ago, it wasn't this church, there was a, another Adventist church I was attending, and there was somebody there that had the jewelry and the necklace, and they were, a, I mean, they, they were a lovely person. And they came up in nominating committee for a position, and the pastor pulled them aside and addressed the jewelry issue. And the words that they said were that this jewelry is not an idol to me. And they refused to take, take it off. And then they left the church. And they're still out of the church today. And I asked the question, was that a true statement? That this jewelry is not an idol to me? Brothers and sisters, to prove that to God, take it off. Leave it aside. Put it away. Don't allow the enemy to plant seeds in your heart, in my heart. It's good to ask just some very basic questions as you hear a message like this. Number one, does God want what's best for you? Do you believe that he wants what's best for you? Would he ever up, you know, uh, uh, uphold uh, anything good from you? Is he trying to make your life worse or better? What's, what's the truth? Better. Would he ever keep any good thing from you? No. Number two, is your own heart trustworthy as you consider a topic like this? Can you say, well, that's, that's for everyone else, but God knows my heart, right? Can we say that? The heart is never trustworthy. We're told it's deceitful above how much? All things. And the third point is, do these earthly things really bring everlasting joy? Never. They all fade. They all rust. They all die. Beauty fades. You buy a new car, you think it's the greatest thing in the world. Within two months, you're you're regretting the payments that you're making on it, right? Nothing lasts. 
except for everlasting one. Desire of Ages, page 618. You know, this came up in, in prayer meeting, and I just thought it was so profound. We always pick on the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't we? Oh, we say they knew he was Christ, and they still wanted to kill him. What was wrong with them? They knew who he was, and they still disobeyed. Now, notice what this says. Many follow in the track of the Pharisees. They revere those who have died in their faith. We do the same, right? We look up to the martyrs. They wonder at the blindness of the Jews in rejecting Christ. Had we lived in his day, they declare, we would gladly have received his teaching. We would never have been partakers in the guilt of those who rejected the Savior. And here's the key, brothers and sisters. But when obedience to God requires self-denial and humiliation, these very persons stifle their convictions and refuse obedience. Thus, they manifest the same spirit as did the Pharisees whom Christ condemned. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't want to be in that camp. Do you? No. You know, there is a, a pearl that we are to seek after, isn't there? A pearl of great price. Matthew 13, Jesus said again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Who's that pearl represent? That's right. And you know, he also gave everything that he had to buy you. Have you ever thought of that? He's asking us to give everything you have to buy that one pearl. And he wants to live on the inside, doesn't he? In the same way, he looks at you as something of great value. I think it's interesting. The, the breastplate of Aaron has just about the same list of gems that Satan had in heaven. But the difference is that these gems on the breastplate of Aaron represent who? That's right. God's people. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And we know that Christ Jesus serves in that heavenly sanctuary today for you and I. And you and I are represented to him as precious jewels, diamonds, things of great value. Malachi chapter 3, 17 and 18, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Brothers and sisters, in our quest to be attractive, know that God finds you of such value that he gave all that he was to purchase you even while you were yet sinners, amen? And someday we will be safe to once again be taken into that glory. And we will not covet the gold. We will not want to wear the streets or poke holes in our ears or anything else. And we'll never hear the words, should I wear this dress or this dress ever again? Right? We will have one garment and it will satisfy for eternity. Can you say amen to that? All right. Let's stand for our closing hymn.